So uh, today's speaker is uh, Shasha Zhu from the University of Michigan and her, her interest is in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere uh, coupling and geomagnetic storm and uh, prior to the University of Michigan she went to the University of Science Technology of China and then uh, UCLA for her PhD and then moved to Michigan uh, as a, a researcher and then I think last year she became an assistant professor uh, so she will talk today about the system science approach to studying the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling, ionospheric storms as an example. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come here and it's really a great honor to give a seminar here at uh, HAO. Um, as you see from the title, um, I want to uh, share with you some of the work that I have done in the last uh, couple of years about ionospheric storms. Um, you know, I used to show a lot of this picture because uh, um, it's my favorite. Really shows the richness and the complexity of the coupled ionosphere thermosphere environment. And I believe many of you here in the audience who are resonant with me on that point, right? Um, this coupled system, you know, is a, a highly driven one due to you know two sources from the sun, the EUVs and also the solar wind. Now, of course, the energies would be processed by the magnetosphere, the magnetic bubble, you know, surrounding um, our geospace. Um, so the ionosphere has this equatorial part and the high latitude part. During quiet times, those two parts, you know, they have their um, own dynamics. They don't. Uh, interact with each other very much, but when the solar forcing increases, both system uh, would expand. So you have the equatorial system expands to higher latitude, and the high latitude system expands to lower latitude ones. So at the interface, there are many very interesting phenomena, including the ionospheric storms. The ionosphere and the thermosphere, you know, participate in the geospace system actively, not just uh, passively, you know, as an area for energy uh, deposition. They uh, influence the mass, the momentum, as well as the energy flows in the whole system. And one of the most important role of the ionosphere is to supply heavy ions, including O+, into uh, the geospace system. Um, the Ion outflow can uh, significantly affect the magnetosphere uh, dynamics, including mass loading the uh, tail region, change the composition of the ring current, and also alter you know the reconduction rate. Uh, in recent years, I think there is a consensus that uh, the ionosphere outflow is actually a two-step process, including the first one, the upflow happening at a lower altitude. And uh, so when the um, plasmas in the ionosphere uh, you know, are lifted to higher altitudes, um, they can be further accelerated and be, um, you know, to gain enough energy and become um, outflow. Some of them will land in the magnetosphere and some of them were just lost in the interplanetary space. Um, a recent study by Nielsen suggested that uh, you know, the total amount of the outflow is highly regulated by how much of this upflow from the topside ionosphere. And so understanding actually the upflow uh, dynamics um, is uh, very important. The ionosphere storm has a long history. Uh, I went back to search for some uh, really classic uh, you know, papers about ionospheric storm, and this one came by Mandela in 1917. This is actually a paper published uh, in Nature where uh, he used uh, one receiver along the east coast and studied like 30 geomagnetic storms. This is a superposed epoch analysis. So during the first day of the storm, you can see the ionosphere density is actually increased, and in the subsequent couple of days, the density decreases. So people give them a name as a positive phase and negative phase of the storms. Um, in the uh, next few years, they added more receivers along the east coast, and now they are able to look at the latitudinal you know, uh, dependence of the storms. And what you can see is uh, at lower latitude, you can have a positive phase, but at higher latitude, it may be already in the negative phase. So there is a lot of structures in the storms, uh, you know, uh, uh, storm time ionosphere. 
in recent years, um, you know, we uh, benefited from the GPS constellation and uh, thousands of ground-based uh, receivers. Uh, the last number that I remember from my uh, collaborator Ansinga about the number of receivers she used to process the data is about 6,000 ground-based receivers. Uh, especially in the last uh, a few years, you know, in the high latitude region like in the polar cap, there are more uh, receivers available. So we have a uh, much better coverage in those uh, regions than before. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, really um, an advantage that we take from um, those GPS um, constellations. So uh, due to these new capabilities, we are able to now Im uh, image in the ionosphere I in two dimension. Um, we discovered considerable structure you know, of the positive phase. For example, now we call it a, a storm-enhanced density, and they used uh, uh, the usually separated them into two different regions. The area at lower latitude or mid-latitude regions where uh, the density increase happens you know, across uh, um, a wide area of uh, magnetic local time. It's uh, called the SED base. Uh, this uh, SED can also extend to higher latitude, you know, um, like a plume. So they call it uh, the SED plume. And uh, many of you have done a uh, fair bit of uh, work on ionosphere storms, so uh, quite familiar with this. Um, in a polar view um, plot, you can see on the right, this uh, plume can sometimes cross the open closed field line boundary and get into the polar cap area where it used to be a uh, low plasma content. So it's a very important means of transporting the day side, you know, the solar produced cold plasma into this uh, high latitude regions, polar cap, and also in the night side, um, the aurora zone. If we, uh, you have a, a incoherent scanner radar, you know, underneath one of those red pixels here, which can give you the altitude profile of this uh, uh, density. And you can see, comparing with choir time, the choir time is a black line, um, blue line is a storm time. You can see that the density at high latitude, uh, high altitude ionosphere, uh, above 300 kilometers increased significantly. This is uh, where the major part of those uh, density enhancement is, actually. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of work when to understand, you know, what caused this density increase in the top side of ionosphere. There have been several mechanisms proposed for the SED formation. One popular mechanism, and uh, many of you know, is uh, the super fountain effect, right? The plasmas in the equatorial region will be lifted to higher altitude, and then they can diffuse along the magnetic field to higher latitude, even reaching like uh, Florida. Um, yeah. Um, and then at those higher latitude, they can be um, uh, they can be carried by the convection patterns which extended to low latitude during strong driving conditions. And then they will be transported to high latitude region. This is a very nice uh, uh, result from the simulation. I think it's a coupled um, semi 3 and uh, RSM simulation. So you can see this plume extracted, um, you know, extending to higher latitude into the polar cap um, area. Yeah. Uh, notice that for this uh, specific storm that they studied, the DST minimum actually reached almost minus 400 nanotesla. So it's one of the biggest storms, you know, the superstorm category. Is that a real event, or were they just feeding it with artificial conditions? I, I think it's a real event, yeah. Uh, it's a real event, I think, back in 2004. I don't remember exactly the date, yeah. Um, but you know, uh, this kind of uh, enhanced uh, TECs and also the plumes are also observed during moderate and intense geomagnetic storms. So here I'm just giving you an example of uh, one of the storms that we studied. You can see this uh, uh, separate peak here, around 50 degrees geomagnetic latitude, clearly separated from the equatorial, uh, you know, high TEC regions. So um, what is the mechanism for this increase? Um, People have suggested that it can be a local imbalance between the production and the loss. You know, so that is, um, you know, at higher latitudes, the magnetic field geometry is quite different than the equatorial regions. Um, 
in the sub-aurora region and the aurora region, those magnetic field would be linking the inner magnetosphere region or plasma sheet you know, in the magnetosphere. And uh, the field inclination is quite high. In those regions, you know, if you can, um, for, somehow, for some reason, lift the plasma to higher altitude, where there are less uh, neutrals, then they recombine much slower. Uh, if the production is still going on, then you can have the total electron content uh, increase. So this is uh, the essence behind the local imbalance between production and the loss. There are um, two different ways to lift the plasma to higher um, altitude. Uh, if you have a eastward electric field, then um, if the magnetic field is also not a purely vertical, then the E cross B drift can have a positive component when you map them into the vertical direction. Similarly, if you have a equator thermospheric wind, um, the wind can also push the plasma to higher altitudes through the collisions you know, between the neutral and the ions. So both mechanisms can push the plasma to higher altitude. Um, in order to find out which is uh, um, a more plays a more important role in lifting the plasma, you know, we will need to measure the three-dimensional plasma velocities simultaneously. And so in our study, we are very interested in doing that. We um, choose the, the instrument called uh, uh, AMIDER, and many of you have heard that before. You know, uh, it is uh, the advanced modular incoherence generator. So far, we have three phases over the globe. Um, one in Poker Flat and two in Resolute Bay. Um, the, the two radars in Resolute Bay are one facing north towards the geomagnetic pole and another one facing Canada is called the Riser C. Um, the third phase you know, started to operate regularly last winter. And so uh, it's very interesting to see those uh, all three radars you know, working together. Um, so in our study, we use uh, the EMISA radars to help us uh, look at uh, the more local um, plasma state parameters, like uh, plasma temperatures, uh, velocities, and also um, you know, the density. Uh, we use uh, the Super Duo Aurora radar network, or the Super Down radars. It's HF radars, so operating at a much lower frequency than the incoherence kind of radar. And uh, the GPS satellite, um, you know, mayor in the TEC, those two instruments gives us the global coverage of the convection and the ionosphere TEC distribution. Okay, so um, in our study, uh, we studied um, all the moderate and uh, intense geomagnetic storms since around 2007. We searched for those events where the fiber radar can be either underneath the SED base region or underneath the SED plume. So we can measure in the local dynamics there. Um, here I'm going to walk you through those two different categories. The first storm was an intense storm that occurred you know, in October 24, 25, 2011. This is the largest one in that year with the symmetric H minimum reached minus 160 nanotesla. It's a very nice ICME trigger storm if you can recognize from the solar wind, you know, after the shock and you have the fluctuating IMF for a couple of hours and then it's a relative steady, you know, southward IMF. You know, those induce uh, this uh, intense geomagnetic storm. The bottom plot here shows you the TC distributions. You know, noon is at the top, uh, dusk is over here, and the feather is right here underneath uh, the SED um, base region. Okay, so now let's look at uh, what the feather data tells us. Um, this is uh, roughly a nine hour feather observations uh, when the feather rotates with the Earth, you know, moved from the dawn sector and then to the dusk sector. This is uh, represent the um, prevailing convection vector uh, directions. So you can see right after the IMF southward turning, uh, we start to see the uh, electron densities. This is from the vertical beam increase. Um, the first the panel, as I mentioned, is a convection vector. The second one is uh, the uh, upward flow speed. So when we calculate the upward flow speed, we combined the uh, contribution from the E cross B and uh, the contribution from the field aligned uh, component. So in those cases, you can see that there is a very large uh, upward uh, lifting. The major contributor uh, is uh, the E cross B convection. The, it's 
about uh, 200 meters per second, if uh, I can, the numbers are correct in here. Um, what you can see is uh, the thermospheric wind is a dashed line. I'm sorry, the anti-parallel um, anti um, flow is a dashed line, which is presumably due to thermospheric wind. Uh, so we can see in this case, both of them you know, can lift to the plasma to higher altitude away from the dense neutrals. So the densities can continue to increase in those uh, regions. And this is uh, uh, very typical in the uh, base region. I think this is also consistent with some of the simulations like uh, Gang have uh, uh, done right in the sub region. Now, in another category, you know, that's when the fiber radar is right underneath the plume. You know, we are very lucky that to find several of those uh, uh, storm. You know, uh, the fiber is right underneath and across to the plume, uh, while the Earth rotates underneath. Um, this is another intense geomagnetic storms back in 2012. Uh, symmetric edge minimum reached minus 120 uh, nanotesla. Again, very nice magnetic cloud signatures. Uh, the IMF turned southward uh, around 18 UT uh, during the first day, and then very stable until the midnight zero UT. There is a further IMF southward turning, you know, so it drives the uh, uh, geospace stronger. And there are some interesting features uh, right after that um, further southward turning. <coughs> okay. Um, here is the fiber observation for this day, and it's exactly the same format. Um, convection flows, upward uh, velocity. This is the average of uh, um, E cross B contribution and the anti parallel contribution for the lower latitude part. And you can see the high latitude and the low latitude behaves very differently in this case. Um, Right after the southward turning, we see the convection increases across this four degree geomagnetic latitude. You know, and here is uh, also you can also see them in the upper flows due to the E cross B flow increase. This is uh, the penetration electric field due to the um, sudden further southward turning, and also you can see the ionosphere densities here um, continue to increase due to this uh, uh, lifting. Um, but in this case, the anti-parallel flows actually is almost uh, zero or you know near the end of this period became a little bit negative. So uh, this would uh, um, push the plasma actually downward, but the total flow is still positive. This uh, um, penetration electric field only lasted for like 15 or 20 minutes. You know, that's typical um, pen, uh, time period for penetration electric field. Right after that, you can see the convection flows continue to increase, but the, uh, field, the field aligned component um, became uh, strongly negative. So this actually overturned the uplifting due to the E cross beam, and now the total uh, flow is downward. You see, now it's downward. And you can also see the density decrease here in the ionosphere. Those uh, net downward flows, uh, you know, they uh, work in the opposite way as the lifting. They push plasma to lower altitude, where they can meet with more like denser neutrals and recombine much faster. Yeah. Um, such uh, um, long-lasting downward flows can uh, effective, very effectively deplete the SED plume. Um, so in some of our um, storms that we studied, we see the, storm, uh, the plume you see here, they stopped here. They never get a chance to actually get into the polar cap. And comparing with those storms where you have the plume get into the polar cap and into the night side aurora zone, the plasma content you know, in the polar cap and in the night side aurora zone are quite different. You, know, you can also uh, imagine the um, consequence of those um, is we probably will see a lower O plus content in the magnetosphere also for those storms. And we're actually um, actively pursuing that part. Sure. In this case, is that the seasonal difference make the background density difference? Say one is a, almost soft, this one is a mm -hmm. equinox. Uh, we have many cases like this, even the ones you know uh, uh, near um, equinox <coughs> can also have the plume di disappeared here. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, we did a further analysis on the large field aligned downward flows. You know, those downward flows are usually produced by either polar or thermospheric wind projected along the, uh, uh, the magnetic field or the ambipolar diffusions. So using the um, plasma state parameters measured by FIDER, we can actually calculate the diffusion velocity. And so then we compare with the observed field aligned flows. And um, interestingly, in some cases, uh, you know, the diffusion velocity is comparable to the observed field aligned flows. But in some cases, you know, they are not large enough to account for the observed field aligned flows. So it has to be due to thermospheric wind in those cases. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any observations on the day side for the wind direction or the magnitude. So I turn to numeric models for help. Um, I used the, the global ionosphere thermosphere model or GITAM model developed by my colleague Aaron Ridley. Um, I think many of you are uh, familiar with uh, this model. Okay. Um, so we drive the GITAM model, use uh, the Weimar electric field um, model and uh, the Ovation Aurora model for all of those geomagnetic storms that we studied. And then we look at uh, the thermospheric wind. Uh, direction and magnitude, you know, uh, for those cases where there is a large discrepancy between the calculated diffusion velocity and uh, the measured field aligned flows. So, like for example, this is one of the cases, the fighter is uh, right here. The thermospheric wind in this case uh, is actually strongly um, um, polar world. This is in geographic coordinates. I think uh, the magnetic pole is somewhere there. Um, but there is a, has a very large polar world component um, reaching about 500 meters per second. This kind of magnitude can explain the discrepancies that we um, had, you know, um, between the diffusion velocity and uh, uh, the measured field aligned flow. So for those uh, moderate and uh, intense geomagnetic s uh, storms that we have studied back in 2014, we have found, you know, four different uh, kind of induced plasma drifts, you know, very earth combination of the anti-parallel flows and the E-cross B flows. The inter interplay between the um, anti-parallel flows, you know, due to the thermospheric wind and uh, then the convection uh, flows determines the density uh, variabilities within the plume itself. So it's not just a purely transport, you know, from the base region. There are a lot of uh, processes going on within the plume uh, generate those uh, um, small scale density structures. Okay, so um, after that, and then the next question I ask myself is, what is actually those north westward convection flows? Are they in the aurora zone? Are they in the sub aurora zone? You know, are they sub aurora polarization streams, or they are just uh, you know penetration electric field? Um, so I went to use the uh, uh, you know ampere to look at the field uh, line current data. Um, like for example, here I show in one for one of those storms. This is uh, the TC, the top panel, and uh, this is uh, the field line current from Ampere. Uh, those are from the 13 magnetic local time. You can see the plume formation um, here and the disappearance after that. During this uh, period, we see the region one upper field line current and the region two downward field line current. Both of them, you know, expand uh, to equator. That means the whole system is still expanding during the main phase of the geomagnetic storm. Um, earlier part of this, the strength of the field line current, downward field line current, is weaker, and then it uh, becomes stronger and stronger. This has some uh, uh, important consequences. Um, I know this is a very busy plot, uh, but bear with me. Here I plotted, you know, the TEC and the field line current as a function of geomagnetic latitude from low to high latitude. This is at the same magnetic local time as the FIDER radars. So we can uh, also superpose the convection flow magnitude and uh, the plasma temperatures on top of this. Um, from the TEC, you can see this is a plume, right? A very large TEC increase. And the field line current here is downward. It's consistent with what we see from the previous slide. But the magnitude is actually very small, the field line current here. The convection flow northwestward 
is lower than a thousand meters per second. You know, um, plasma temperature. This uh, gray is uh, for the ion, and uh, black is for electron. So interestingly, you can see in the middle of the plume, we see the electron temperatures uh, decrease. This is. Uh, um, uh, uh, we can understand this just the, you know, because there is no further heating coming from the inner magnetosphere during this time period, and the density increased significantly, so the electron temperature has to decrease uh, within the plume. Well, during the plume decaying phase here, this is uh, also the interface of the plume and the trough region, because the TEC now is very low. The region 2 downward field line current here um, much larger than that before. Also, the convection flows now is uh, um, more than a thousand uh, meters per second. The effect of this high flow speed is uh, the frictional heating and significantly increased ion and electron temperatures here in the plume and the trough uh, interface. You know, so. This is uh, interesting. The northwestward convection flows, they are very important in terms of lifting the plasma to higher altitude and then reduce the combination. But it cannot be too large. When the speed is too large, you know, they just frictional heat the ions and uh, then the temperature increase, so the recombination increases. So um, in many of the, our cases, we see the plume formation is actually in the region slightly equatorward of the center of the saps flow channels. Okay. Now, um, I'll show a few slides about uh, GITAM simulations. You know, the GITAM is similar to the TIE GCM or time GCM. It's a three-dimensional time-dependent uh, global model. So for, uh, we can use those models to study the time evolution of the SED. Um, in this case, we uh, traced the simulation columns, you know, across uh, the plume here and backwards in time. This is where we they were, you know, two hours earlier. Um, so you can see they can either come from the dusk sector or the um, dawn sectors, of course, and uh, merged in the convection throat regions. You know, um, we um, further compare the plasma characteristics, including the HMF2 and NMF2, along the trajectories. Uh, here I'm only showing you the two plasma uh, columns from the dusk convection sector and the dawn ones. The first row shows the HMF2 and the second row shows NMF2. And the scales are all the same, so it can easy to compare. The solid line is when the IMF southward turning happened, and then the dashed line is uh, when the northward IMF turning happened. So you can see right after the IMF southward turnings, then the HMF2 for those plasmas coming from the dusk side increased significantly, you know, uh, 75 kilometers within half an hour. Um, but this one from the dawn sector seems, you know, uh, doesn't care what IMF is doing very much. Um, this is probably due to the dipotude, you know, for this specific case. Um, the NMF2, you see, for the one coming from the dusk side, it actually didn't show very much of uh, increase, um, slightly decreased the comparing with that before. It's probably the production is not uh, um, catching up with the lifting of the um, plasma to high altitude. You know, um, so this study showed that you know the plasma coming from the two um, convection cells, they can also contribute to the plume, but they have very different characteristics. So maybe it can help us to understand uh, their origins if, uh, for people use observations. Now, um, we further look at the loss and the source processes uh, during the, um, along the trajectories. The first two here is right after the southward turning. The black line is before, and uh, the blue is right after. So you see, after the southward turning, the top side ionosphere density increased, and uh, the HMF2, HMF2 also is higher than that before. Um, the right column here, I plotted the very representative, you know, density instantaneous density change after the model updates its vertical, its chemistry, and the horizontal module. So you can see that in the top side, the density increase um, is mainly due to the vertical transport here. Mm -hmm. 
And similarly, after the northward turning, the topside ionosphere density decreased significantly due to you know, the downshifting of the plasmas to lower uh, altitude. So now at uh, the top side, for this case, the vertical drift is a loss process, and it's a source uh, process for the lower altitude. In both cases, of course, the chemistry is at lower altitude is uh, the major uh, loss process. So, um, so far we have seen cases where um, some plumes um, can make into the polar cap and some cannot. For those ones that indeed you know, enter the polar cap, they need to cross the open closed field line boundary. And there are some very interesting phenomena happening here. Uh, like in this case, uh, June 1st, 2013, it's a very intense geomagnetic storm uh, with symmetric H about minus 40 nanotesla. You know, again, seems due to an ICME-driven storm. Um, you can see here, this is Alaska. Um, before the strong southward turning, there is already some plume uh, like signatures across this region. Right after that very large southward turning, then the polar cap expanded equatorward very quickly and crossed the fighter locations. So we can look at uh, the interaction of uh, the plume plasma with uh, the cusp. Okay. Um, here is uh, the fighter field aligned beam observation. Um, this is uh, uh, the p SED plume plasma. You can identify that by the uh, lifted F region here. Um, this is a, a period where there is a very large uh, density enhancement together with the uh, increased ion electron temperatures and also divergent plasma flows moving away from the density peak, you know. And the, the flux here, uh, the upper flux is also very large, reached about two times 10 to the 14th um, uh, number per square meter per second. This is the one or two order of magnitude than what is usually the typical upflow uh, magnitude. Um, this uh, temperature uh, increase signature is uh, uh, due to the softer electrons coming from the cusp region. We have a very fortunate DMSP pass, you know, uh, crossed the fiber locations within one MLT, so we can know what are the particle precipitation looks like. And this is uh, for the electrons, this is for the ions. So very intense, low energy um, plasmas in the cusp region, lower than 100 EV, and uh, cl uh, classic you know, ion dispersion signatures for the cusp. So we know for sure that the energy source is uh, the particles that's coming from the cusp region. Um, you know, the ion upflows are usually categorized, uh, categorized into two. Uh, one is a type two, uh, I'm sorry, type one upflow. That's when only the ion plasma temperature increase. And then the other class is uh, the type two upflow when the electron and the ion temperature, both of them increase. So in order to understand that, we look at the temperature changes. And you already seen from the previous slides very clearly, both temperatures increased significantly comparing with the, the quiet times. You know, the electron temperature here at higher altitude is close, uh, is uh, more than 4,000 Kelvin, you know. So this upflow event can be categorized as a type two upflow. As I mentioned, the upflow flux itself reached the two times 10 to the 14 um, per square meter per second. It's very large. And so we want to understand uh, what are those contributing factors to this large upflow fluxes. The first thing we explored is uh, the preconditioning by the storm enhanced density. Um, Right after the southward turning, the convection start to uh, increase and expand to lower latitude. Uh, also, the uplift uh, flow speed is also very large. You can see this density you know, moved to higher altitude. Uh, we compare the densities uh, after the southward turning and that before the southward turning. Uh, it increased about 54% at uh, 600 kilometers. A recent simulation work by Cohen et al. showed that you know those uh, initial uh, densities before the uh, onset of the particle precipitation actually very important for the um, flux itself. Although the you when you increase the number density, you can you lower the upflow speed um, 
but the uh, flux itself is much larger. So we think that the preconditioning by the storm enhanced density contribute to this large um, upflow flux. The other factor we considered is uh, the temperature dependent uh, chemi chemical reaction rate. Um, as uh, I mentioned, both the ion and the electron temperature increased significantly during this case. We know that um, the charge exchange rate is directly pro proportional to the ion temperature. So when you increase that, you increase the charge exchange rate. And uh, the dissociative recombination rate, on the other hand, can decrease when the electron temperature uh, increases. So when you have both the ion and the electron temperature increase, how are you going to change the electron loss rate? Um, we did a, a simple estimation using uh, a following Drew et al.'s work, earlier work. This is uh, um, the ion temperature, the electron temperature. The black curve shows uh, uh, what is uh, the typical reaction rate you know, using the parameters um, before the onset of the um, precipitation. Um, this is five, uh, 400 kilometers, 500 and 600 kilometers. One thing interesting is uh, at lower Latitude, you can see, is highly dependent on the ion temperature, very sensitive. While you move to the higher altitude, um, it's uh, not very sensitive to the ion temperature. This is simply because you have less neutrals at uh, those high altitude, you know, so the charge exchange doesn't care very much about the ion temperature. Okay, so you can see there are two dots, and those are the temperatures that are measured by the two beams of fiber. So I placed them here, you can see at 400 kilometers, the uh, electron loss rate increased the comparing with the choir time. But for those two at a higher altitude, uh, the electron loss rate actually reduced due to the significantly enhanced electron temperature. So we think that uh, the, um, this uh, temperature dependent chemical reaction rate also contributes to the large upflow fluxes um, in this case. Um, as I showed, the DMSP and also the, the CASP signatures uh, in this case uh, was observed actually around 16 MLT. It's quite, uh, you know, close, uh, quite close to the dusk side. So we performed a global magnetosphere simulation for this event just to provide us a large scale global context of what's going on in the magnetosphere. Uh, we used the MHD model, the BATS-RS, and also the inner magnetosphere module, the CRCM, and the ionosphere module for this simulation. This is the field line current, you know, color coded, and the black curve here is the open closed field line boundary. So in this case, you know, the open closed field line boundary location agrees very well with the DMSP. For this event, you know, uh, to the beginning of the southward turning and uh, close to the end of the southward turning, the open closed field line boundary location match very well with the DMSP. But we found that in between, you know, the simulation opened up much slower than, uh, in, than the DMSP um, observed the open closed field line boundary. Okay, so then the bottom plot here, we look at uh, you know, the topology of the magnetic field and uh, also the plasma flows in the equatorial magnetosphere. This is the Earth, the color coded is uh, the VZ component. You notice some of them are like yellowish regions. They indicate that there are um, you know, uh, reconnection going on in that locations. After the reconnection, the those are the jets moving away from the reconnection site. So you can see an enhanced VZ component in the MHD uh, simulation. This enhanced reconnection site matched uh, very well with uh, uh, you know, the DMSB observed cusp location and also the region where we see the enhanced upflow fluxes. So um, luckily in this case, you know, everything agree um, with each other. Um, I think the important message about you know, this event study is that the mass, the momentum, and the energy couplings between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere thermosphere underneath can occur 
on very small spatial and temporal scale. If we wanted to capture the total amount of ion upflow and outflow coming from the ionosphere, you know, we have to do a very uh, good job in terms of forecasting the location of those intense energy input from uh, the magnetosphere. So the last part I want to talk about, the polar cap patches. This is when the SED plume actually entered, uh, crossed the open closed field line boundary, and entered the polar cap. Uh, in many cases, they are sliced into the patches. Here is an example from um, the other face of the a radar. radar is the riser north. Um, I don't know which one is north, actually, in this case. <laughs> um, the one on the left. The one? This one? <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so this is uh, the density measured by the riser north. And you can see a tall, high-density stripes in the data. This, those are um, polar cap patches. You know. They usually extend from about 200 kilometers and all the way to um, five or 600 kilometers. Um, there are large, very large density gradient um, in the surrounding region of the patches. So people are very interested in the, um, you know, scintillation effects uh, uh, due to those patches. We studied about three years of the riser north data and uh, a total of uh, 4,700 radar operation hours, and uh, we automatically identify each of those density stripes. We identify the location of the peak and the two minimums in the surrounding regions. So um, have a nice database of uh, about 1,700 patches. And in this uh, talk, I want to show you a subset of those uh, patch event. That is a continuous uh, radar run for about a week back in 2011. Um, more than 100 patches at uh, found uh, during that week. We divided this 100 patches into uh, different sectors, you know, the noon sector, dusk, dawn, and midnight, and uh, look at uh, how the density and the fluxes, flux changes. Um, I'm showing you the electron density and the flux are at noon MLT. This is a dusk. The dawn sector ones are very close, similar to dusk, so I only showed the dusk. And uh, the bottom one is uh, at midnight. The blue line or blue symbols are the um, patch in the center of the patch. And then this is the reference line, you know, the average of all the observations to give you an idea of the water average on the sphere should look like. So not surprisingly, the density in the patch is higher than uh, the surrounding regions. Uh, and you can see from noon to the midnight sector, the NMF2 and HMF2 are quite stable, actually. But the top side density decreased significantly while you move uh, from the day side to the night side. If you look at the flux here, although there are very uh, large uncertainties um, here, in general, we can see a downward flow, plasma flow. Um, below about 600 kilometers. So those plasma flows can uh, sustain the F region peak here at lower altitude. That's why this uh, NMF2 didn't change very much uh, while the patches move from the noon to the midnight sector, but the top side density decreased. And at the same time, you know, above 600 kilometers, we see they move upward. So those are, again, the upflow fluxes. Some of them may be able to you know, further energize and move into the magnetosphere or even lost into the interplanetary space. Um, while you move to dusk or the midnight sectors, use the fluxes are not very obvious. You, know, you can find them on um, each side. So we cannot join in um, seeing definitively. Um, in those uh, locations, but on the day side, you know, it's very clear. Could I just ask, the lower left figure, is that uh, the double peak due to the fact that you have downward flow below and upward flow above, or why is You mean here? Yes. Um, for this case, I wonder, you know, it's probably a very small number of uh, 
patches entered into this uh, statistics. So in some local times, um, because here we are separating 100 patches into four different sectors, mm -hmm. so I have to guess it's actually due to a small number there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the summary, um, I kind of took the journey of the SED plasma as uh, an example of the system science approach to studying you know, the MIT coupling processes. Um, we, uh, we talk about you know, the major contributing factors to the uplifting of the plasma in the day side SED base region. It's both the convection electric field and also the equator thermospheric wind contribute positively. But when you move to the plume regions, the wind direction changes to um, polarward, and so they may actually um, overturn the convection, the lifting due to the convection electric field and push plasma downward. So um, an important factor for the decaying of the plume. Yeah, so the result is not all the plume can enter the polar cap. For those cases where the plume indeed cross the open closed field line boundary and enter the polar cap, they uh, would interact with the day side cusp region. You know, they preconditions the top side ionosphere for very intense ion upflows at the day side cusp. Once they moved into the polar cap areas, you know, they are often sliced into the polar cap patches, as I have shown you. And uh, we observe the divergent plasma flows. Um, uh, for those patches that are on the day side, you know, they feed their layer at uh, the lower altitude and provide upflows um, to the higher altitudes. And then um, our group are still continuing doing the patch studies at the night side interaction with the aurora zone. Some of them may, you know, um, turn around and follow the convection flows and just return to the day side. Okay, so here is just a summary slide. I will stop here. Thank you. Do you, can you, uh, how do you explain the, the divergence of the rocks at the top side? Okay. Let me go back. Um, so for the downward part, I think, you know, because the riser north is about 84 degree geomagnetic latitude, so the magnetic field is almost vertical. The uh, horizontal wind or the convection flows do not affect the plasma flows very much. So essentially, like you have a high density layer moved into that area, and now there is nothing can support them. So they start to diffuse downward, just due to the gravity and uh, the pressure gradient force. And for the upflow part, I think there are soft electron precipitations either from the polar rain um, or maybe uh, the mantle area. So do you see the uh, temperature gradient at these regions? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So right. you were showing um, some comparisons with the MHD modeling, and uh -huh. there's no plasmosphere in that model, as no. I understand it. Uh -huh. So how does that, af shouldn't that affect some of the comparisons that you're doing? Oh, for this uh, simulation, our purpose is just to looking at what are the reconnection, uh, you know, uh, where uh, do they occur. So because this is a low Mahon number case, we can have simul uh, reconnection actually happening on the, like, dusk or the dawn sector, you know, far away from the day side. And uh, we want to use this simulation to help us understand the cusp observed at uh, 16 MLT. You know, it's quite far away from the noon sector. Okay, not yeah. as much about the plume dynamics. No, no, yeah. Because yeah. okay. mm -hmm. we don't have plasma sphere, as you mentioned. Yeah. Well, Howard, I think your question uh, harks back to an era where we were speaking of plasma spheric plumes. Uh, but that, that idea didn't pan out. Uh, one of the reasons that it didn't pan out is that in your model and in our models and so forth, you can make a plume in the ionosphere without any plasma sphere at all. And the mechanism, mm -hmm. as that's explicated by work, work by Joe Olay and Wen Bin Wang, uh, Yu Yi Dong, and now yourself, uh, the main mechanism is this uplifting mm -hmm. of the day side yeah. ionosphere. And as we all know, 
a higher ionosphere, it's a bigger ionosphere, and more of an ionosphere, and it lasts longer. And uh, so, so these things aren't plumes at all. A plume is something that gets blown from point A to point B, like like a smoke plume, or you know, or you know, or, uh, something like that. These are more like clouds. They 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 arise from convection. So we should stop calling them plumes. <laughs> we call them what they are, which is mm -hmm. more of enhanced density. That's perfectly fine. Words, uh -huh. or something like that. Uh, now, now, you, however, here's my question. Sorry about the long lecture, but 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 here's my question. I think you're implying that when this this extra plasma gets gets into the polar cap, then at high altitude it can get transported and sliced up, as mm -hmm. you said, and, and yeah. more polar pressure. So that actually is evidence of some uh, transport process as opposed to a vertical motion. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the density enhancement phase usually happens at a uh, you know relatively lower latitude because that's when you can the convection and the wind can lift to the plasma. When you move to the polar cap area, because the magnetic field is almost vertical, so those actually won't be able to lift to the plasma anymore. Yeah. So then you just be purely transport due to the E cross B drift. Oh, and I should have mentioned uh, Jing Liu just published a paper uh, showing the same thing with the dynamics of what, where these plumes come from and, and mm -hmm. indicating that the electric field is forcing the plasma up, mm -hmm. up in altitude is, is the primary, although not the only cause. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, it would be interesting to look at that. Yeah. So, I mean, just to comment on what you said, I mean, that helps explain to me, I think, why the word plasmosphere was never used in the talk, probably. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. I'm still... It the idea I'm, because, you know, there were these pictures but, of the yeah. plasmosphere right. with the footprint coming down in the plume, and it was all... Yeah. It was all... Uh, well, but there must be that's some that's connection. That happens at lower latitudes. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. I, mean, I think, no, although those are really. two distinct <laughs> regions, but the, magnet, but, but the electric field maps from the magnetosphere to the ionosphere backward, you know. So when we have the lifting due to those northwestward flows in the ionosphere, at the same time, we have uh, the, those electric field, you know, transport to the plume, I'm sorry, the <laughs> plasma sphere. <laughs> Transport the plasma, outer plasma layers and form the plume. So those two processes happen together. Yeah. Yeah. It is true that the electric fields mm -hmm. are the main mechanism yeah. in which this occurs. Mm -hmm. And those electric fields, of course, uh, originate in the magnetosphere. And you need, you need some region two currents in order to make the whole thing happen. Yes, so, yeah. So from that point of view, yeah, of course, the electric mm -hmm. fields magnetosphere driven electric fields are, are what's behind all of them. Yeah, so this is one thing I found uh, fascinating, almost I uh, just have one comment. Yeah, and uh, the region to field line currently you can see the couplings that I showed there cannot be too strong. If it's too strong, then the sap's flow uh, magnitude is too large and the frictional he heating happens and then, you know, so that will destroy the plume very quickly. Bing -jian. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, just to, to my comment to uh, uh, Stan, it's just, I mean, there are plasmospheric plumes. It's just that they're ionospheric, but this is not connected to this oh, phenomenon. Oh, I know. There is such a thing in the <laughs> yeah, plasmosphere. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but are they, are they plumes? Are they transport of plasma? Yes, I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. they're transporting <laughs> plasmospheric plasma okay. that because the, the, the uh, uh, convection electric field has increased and the boundary of the plasma plasma. Yeah, sorry, and what I know is that somebody <laughs> thought that those plasmospheric plumes were manifesting in the ionosphere. At high latitudes. Like John Cleese. Like, like John Cleese. Like but that, <laughs> end, but <laughs> that, that idea just didn't pan out. Okay. Oh, I, I just have a, a, a small comment following Dr. Singer's question. So. Uh -huh. For this kind of simulation, I think the agreement here is actually fantastic. Right? You see, everything goes really well. Thank you. So what's, what's going on here is that in the system, you do have plasma sphere, you know, the plasma sitting there. And then when you have, you have this storm going on, you push everything and you start to do connection. And what we know is that the plasma sphere density has a lot to do with the reconnection rates. So if you change the reconnection rate, you change the solar wind, when you surface coupling, you change the sheath, you change everything, and it would probably make your comparison worse mm -hmm. in that case. Yeah, so, uh, so I have two comments after that. You know, So the first thing is, here we see on the in the ionosphere altitude, the, uh, the plume definitely reached the cusp. 
And do we know that whether the plume actually reached the daisy magnetopause in the equatorial plane? Um, I think that's a question, at least I think. Um, and the second thing is, if we don't have the plasma sphere plume reaching the day side magneto uh, pulse reconduction site, how long is it going to take for those upflow and outflow to actually reach, you know, uh, from the ionosphere to reach the magnetosphere reconduction site? I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I agree with that, but my, my, actually my, my show is more like the search rather than the plume. So you have the plasma sitting there, you have the merging coming on, you actually push the surge up there and you're going to change the change the reconnection or whatever going there before all these ionospheric stuff starts you know, kicking in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's that's going to change the results mm -hmm. a lot, but that might be something you know, to look at. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, so we definitely need to couple the plasma sphere in the simulation to find out the feedbacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No more questions. Thank you. Again. Okay. Thank you.